Welcome to the channel and welcome to this review of the Gene Steel Colts Codex which is up for pre-order today on Saturday the 2nd of February and you can get it from Games Workshop at the 9th of February. Thank you to Games Workshop for sending it through to me and to other people in the community so we can get our paws into it, our claws into it, our fangs into it and uh, delve inside and uh, give you guys uh, an overview of what's in here and what to expect from the new Gene Steeler Colts. Most people are here for the rules, but before I do a quick nod towards the narrative, the Gene Stealer Cults are spreading, they're all over the place. The narrative in here is actually quite good. Um, some of the codexes are a bit in hit and miss when it comes to the narratives, but in here it's very good. And it gives you the real impression that the Gene Stealer Cults have got their claws into a huge portion of the galaxy. On the galaxy map it shows you that Gene Stealer Cults are even springing up on Terra and Mars and Krieg and Talan and places like that. The whole galaxy is becoming infested with the Gene Stealer cults. They've turned the threat level from the cultists from what was a secondary codex, which was a second tier faction, which was something that was happening in the background, to something as big and as menacing as the orcs and the tyrannids themselves. So well done for that. So it's very good at getting over the idea that the Gene Stealer cults are a significant threat to the very fabric of the Imperium itself and to Tau, the Tau people as well, those blue guys over on the east. Um, they're popping up all over the place. They're quite nasty. The, the second thing about the Gene Stealer cults, if you don't know, is there is a chunk of new models in here as well. So uh, well done Games Workshop for that. If you're a cultist player, then um, you're going to be very pleased to get your hands on some of the new toys. If you're not a cultist player, then the army very, very much feels very rounded out now. There's quite a lot of choices in here. Quite a not, lot of new elite characters, new fast attacks in here as well. Um, so let's dive into the rules. What do the Gene Stealer Cults do? Well, first up, many of the units in here have the rule unquestioning royalty, loyalty, unquestioning royalty, unquestioning loyalty. So each time you fail a saving throw for a character model, and each time a character model suffers a mortal wound, before you inflict any damage on that character, uh, check to see if they're within any three inches of any cult or any uh, brood brothers units with this ability, the unquestioning loyalty ability. And if they do, you can select one of those units and a roll of four up. Don't inflict any damage on the character, but one model in the selected unit is slain. So say your character is taken a hit by a multiple damage weapon, even a LAS cannon, on a four up, you don't have to apply any of that damage to that character. If there's another cultist unit within three inches that have unquestioning loyalty, just roll a four plus on that unit and uh, one of those guys are going to get vaporized instead of your um, character taking up to d6 damage. Um, it's going to make them very immune to sniper weaponry or weaponry that can target characters from a long way away. It's going to make their characters very immune to mortal wounds from psychic attacks as well because on a, you've got a 50-50 chance of shucking it off onto a, 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 a guy nearby that's got the unquestioning loyalty ability. Now the second thing that you have in here is cult ambush and um, when you set up any units at the start of the game you have three choices for all those units that you set up at the start of your game. Every unit in this book has got the cult ambush ability, including layman russes and chimeras and things like that. However, during deployment, if this unit has the infantry or biker keyword, you can set it up in an ambush or underground or on the battlefield. So even though everything's got cult ambush in here, that cult ambush keyword will work for um, various stratagems that we'll talk about later on. Um, Generally speaking, the cult ambush ability only affects infantry and bikers. So all your infantry and bikers, when you deploy them at the start of the game, you've got three choices. One, set them up as normal. Two, you can set them up underground if they're an infantry or biker. And if you set them up underground, then they can appear at the end of any of your movement phases anywhere on the battlefield more than nine inches away from enemy models. So far, so good. Set it up on the battlefield, stick them in reserve essentially, and then pop them up nine inches away from any me models at the end of any of your movement phases. Lovely job. But you can also put them in ambush. And if you put them in ambush, you use the cult ambush markers, which are shown on the screen now. And the cult ambush markers, instead of putting the units underground or instead of putting them on the battlefield, instead you put these markers down in your deployment zone. And um, if you put units in transports, then Basically, for every unit you decide to put in ambush, you put a marker down instead. So, 
for your army, you might have a couple of vehicles that you're going to set up in your deployment zone. And then you might have a bunch of units with the infantry and biker keyword. You might decide to put half of them underground and then half of them in an ambush. And the half that you put in ambush, for every one that you decide to put in ambush, you put one of these marker down. So when your opponent looks across the battlefield at your army, they'll see some vehicles. They'll know that you have some stuff that can pop up from underground anywhere on the battlefield at the end of any of your movement phases. And they'll see a bunch of red blips. And they won't know what those red blips are. Um, you'll reveal those blips in turn one. So if you've got turn one, at the start of your first turn, you've got to say, right, I'm revealing this blip here. You put a model down within an inch of that blip. And then you deploy everything within six inches of that blip that you put down. So you put your troops units down basically where that blip was. And um, each of these models must be wholly within your deployment zone, wholly within six inches of the first model that you put down within an inch of the blip and more than nine inches away from enemy models. So your opponent won't necessarily know what you're setting up and where you're setting it up in turn one after watching how he or she deploys everything on the other side of the battle grid you can decide, right, OK, from this blip here, I'm going to make this unit appear. And from this blip over on the left, I'm going to make this unit appear. And um, yeah, you might have five blips and you can choose what appears from those cult ambush markers. Now, if you've got second turn, af after your opponent has moved and set up any of their um, reinforcements after their movement phase, then you reveal all your ambush markers in your deployment zone as described before. So you go in second, your opponent comes running toward your lines and um, they have to stay nine inches away from your stuff, from your uh, ambush markers. Uh, they can't, if your opponent is first term, then none of their units can be set up or end within nine inches of any of your ambush markers. So it's a way of keeping very, very fast units back, which is nice. And then after they finish their move, then you reveal all your stuff. So these cult ambush markers, you'll only ever use them in turn one. And that's what they do. You, you put them ambush markers down. Your opponent doesn't know what's going to appear from the blips. And then you reveal them at the end of your movement phase in turn one. Or you reveal them at the end of the opponent's movement phase. And after they've deployed any reserves in turn one. But there's some sneaky things that you can do with these cult ambush markers if you spend a couple of stratagems, if you spend a CP. So one stratagem is called They Came From Below. And use this stratagem before you re reveal any ambush marker. Select up to three units, excluding vehicles, from your army that are set up in ambush. For each unit that you select, remove one ambush marker from the battlefield. These units are no longer set up in ambush and instead placed underground. So for example, in your deployment zone, you might have six infantry units. You've put three of them underground so that they can appear anywhere on the battlefield. And you put three blip markers down in your deployment zone. And that's how you deploy. And then your opponent comes charging towards your lines, charging towards those blips. And before you reveal those ambush markers at the end of their movement phase, you can say, well, I'm going to spend a command point. And instead of those three blips, instead of appearing, um, instead, those three units won't appear from those blips in ambush. Instead, I'm going to place them underground and they're going to come in from reserves. So um, some shenanigans there. I like it. And there's another one called Meticulous Uprising, which is another CP. Both of these only cost one CP. Use this stratagem before you reveal any ambush marker. And you can move your ambush markers up to 12 inches each. And these markers cannot be moved within nine inches of an enemy model or outside of your deployment zone. So again, your opponent could come racing down towards your three blip markers and you place them very, very carefully. So they're in front of some large line of sight blocking terrain or in, for, for, in front of some buildings or something. And you spend a command point and you suddenly move all three of these blip markers back so that they're behind the line of sight blocking terrain or they're inside the building before you reveal them. So suddenly they've moved or you can move them to the right or you can move them to the left. You can move them 12 inches away so long as they stay within your deployment zone. I like it very much. Well, you spend two command points. You could move up to three of your um, cult ambush markers using meticulous uprising. And you can spend another command point 
and use the they came from below stratagem and suddenly pick up three of those blip markers and put three units in ambush instead in um, underground. So um, I very much like that uh, idea. I very much like the idea, not that I play Gene Steel Colts, but uh, anything that allows you options to move, redeploy and do shenanigans with your units in your deployment zone in turn one is a very interesting mechanic. It's very unique to Cult Ambush. It's very unique to Gene Steel Colts and it makes the game more interesting. It makes the game... Uh, it'll make it feel more unique to play this army and more unique to play against them. I very much like the idea of being able to move these markers 12 inches away or suddenly saying, well, you know, you came charging towards these two over here with your bikers and with your terminators and with your, and there's some significant aggression on this flank. You know what? I'm going to make those markers disappear and instead put these units underground instead. Um, it's very nice. Very good shenanigans. I like it very much. And, um, I don't think it will break the game. I think it will just make it very, very interesting to play against. And it adds a layer of tactical element that works as a sentence. Yes, it adds a tactical layer to how you play the game and how you'll have to think your way around playing these sneaky Gene Steeler Colts popping up all over the place. Just to be clear, it does say ambush markers are not units and cannot be targeted, attacked or destroyed. Um, so just a bit of clarification there and there's a couple, of, a couple of other little bits of clarification in the cult ambush rules to answer any questions that you might have but I'm not going to go through it all in incredible detail that's generally how they work now if you bring a battle forged army there's a couple more rules that you can get as well and um, one is insurrectionists so all troops basically get the um, objective secured rule any troops um, always control an objective marker, even if there's more enemy models within range of that objective marker, unless the enemy unit has a similar ability and then you count off as normal. So you have insurrectionists if you bring a battle forged army and also you get access to their cult creeds and their cult creeds are their chapter tactics, their craft world traits, those things. They're six different cult creeds. Now, Cult creeds only affect certain units. There are some units in this codex called Brood Brothers. And um, in order to get a cult creed, everyone in a particular detachment must have the Gene Stealer Cults keyword. But in that particular detachment with the Gene Stealer Cults keywords, you can slot in Brood Brother units. And then it doesn't prevent you from getting a cult creed. Creed brood brother units would be things like um, a layman Russ or a Chimera or just their standard squad infantry dudes, the cheap troops which are called brood brothers infantry squad. So you can stick them in uh, your detachment, and um, any brood brothers in detachments don't get access to cult creeds. So you're not suddenly getting these abilities on your layman Russes, on your standard infantry squads, on your Chimeras, on your Sentinels, on your things like that. Um, Brood Brothers don't get access to cult creeds and also Gene Stealer units also do not get a cult creed which is interesting because there is a cult creed which allows you to re-roll hit rolls and Gene Stealers with re-roll to hit would be crazy um, but everything else pretty much gets a cult creed um, we'll get to cult creeds in a bit because there's also an extra thing that it says as well it says that if your army is battle forged you can include an Astra Militarum detachment in your army for each Gene Stealer Cult detachment in your army. So if you bring a Gene Stealer Cult detachment, then you can bring an Astra Militarum detachment as well. If you bring two Gene Stealer Cult detachments, you can bring two Astra Militarum detachments in your army. The Astra Militarum named characters, can, you can't bring named characters. And the Astra Militarum detachments are known as Brood of Brothers, so they don't get access to cult creeds. And any regiment keywords don't work. You switch all of them for Brood Brothers instead. And also you don't get any orders. Um, they also gain the unquestioning loyalty ability, that one where you can intercept um, hits to a character. But it goes on and on and on about um, Brood Brothers from Astra Militarum. Basically, your warlord cannot be from a Brood Brothers detachment. You don't get access to orders from the Astra Militarum. You also don't get command benefits from the Astra Militarum, stratagems or relics or things like that. Long story short, 
you can plug in Astra Militarum detachments into this. They don't get cult creeds, but they also don't get anything juicy from the Astra Militarum codex either, like stratagems, command traits, name characters, relics, any of that sort of stuff. You just get the models. Um, what you do get is you get the Brood Brothers keyword and you do get the Unquestioning Loyalty keyword as well. Um, it also says, in addition, the command benefit command benefits of all Brood Brother detachments, including in your army. So if you just bring a detachment of just Brood Brothers, like Astra Militarum, are halved, rounding up. So if you'd normally get five command points for an Astra Militarum detachment that you're bringing along, you half that rounding up. You'll only get three. This reflects that such detachments are not a Gene Stealer Cult's primary fighting force, and the acquisition of such military assets is costly in terms of resource. So I guess, narratively speaking, you've already spent a couple of CPs plugging in your super heavy Bane Blade or your um, Earthshaker Cannons or whatever Basilisks and whatever you want to add to your Gene Stealer Cult's army. Um, nice set of rules, very, very clearly written out in the book as well about how you can bring them along. But essentially, if you want to mix and match a Gene Stealer Cult with Astra Militarum, you can. You lose all the juicy benefits of the Astra Militarum. But suddenly you can bring tanks and 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 artillery and hellhounds and things like that if you want to bring them along and have a pretty mixed Gene Stealer cults list. Right, now we're going to go on to the cult creeds. Remember, Gene Stealers don't get this. Any Brood Brothers, such as Rastam and Laterum stuff, doesn't get this. But there's six of them. And the first one is called the Cult of the Four-Armed Emperor, and they are subterranean ambushers. And at the end of the first battle round, first battle round only, Add one to advance and charge rolls made for units with this cult creed. However, starting from the second battle round, if a unit with this cult creed is set up on the battlefield, then until the end of that turn, you can add one to advance and charge rolls for that unit. So if you've stuck any units underground and they're going to pop up in turn two or pop up in turn three, nine inches away from an enemy, as they normally do, when you charge, you can add one to their charge rolls. So instead of a 9 inch charge, you've got an 8 inch charge. Again, this doesn't apply to gene stealers, but it would apply to aberrants or hybrids and things like that. Suddenly you've got an 8 inch charge when they're popping up all over the place. Add one to advance and charge rolls. The pauper princes are devoted zealots. You can re-roll hit rolls for attacks made with melee weapons by a unit with this cult creed in a turn which it made a charge, was charged, or performed a heroic intervention. Reroll hit rolls on the charge or when you charge. That one's quite juicy. If you've got a close combat army full of aberrants and full of your hybrids and things like that, and you really want to get up in someone's face, then this is the uh, this is the one for you. The hive cult are disciplined militants. If a unit with this cult creed fails a morale test, they half the numbers that flee, rounding up. So you're going to lose less models when they run away. But in addition, units with this cult creed can still shoot in the turn when they fall back. If they do so, you must subtract one from their hit rolls in the shooting phase that turn. So they get the Ultramarines type ability. They can fall back and still fire. And you half the number when they get slaughtered in the morale phase. So that one's obviously aiming towards those shooty kind of um, Gene Stealer cult lists that sit back and shoot. And when the enemy gets in amongst your lines, you can still fall back and shoot. The bladed cog. The bladed cog, these are cyborgized hybrids. Cyborg hybrids. These are the gene stealer cults that spring up on forge worlds and heavy industrial worlds. And all models in this cult creed have a six up invulnerable save. Models with this cult creed that already have an invulnerable save improve their invulnerable save by one to a maximum of three plus. You can see why they don't give these sorts of things to gene stealers, right? In addition, Infantry models with this cult creed do not suffer the penalty to their hit rolls for moving and shooting heavy weapons. Now that's going to be quite important because with mining lasers and with some other, other of the guns inside the Gene Stealer Cult Codex and having most of their army hitting on a 4-up in the shooting phase, being able to move and shoot heavy weapons without that modifier, that's quite powerful. Some of the guns in here are very powerful. The Rusted Claw are nomadic survivalists. 
And when they make saving throws, you add one to the result of the weapon being used to make the attack. Um, add one to the result if the weapon being used to make the attack has an armor penetration characteristic of zero or minus one. So basically, most of the units in this book, most of your standard infantry have a five up save. You can get a four up save if you're getting shot at from an AP zero or AP minus one weapon. You can add one to your saving throws. In addition, biker models with this cult creed do not suffer the penalty to their hit rolls for moving or shooting heavy weapons or for advancing and shooting assault weapons. The bikers in here, the Atalan bikers, they hit on a four up. They can get some nice guns. They can get a mining laser as well. So having them moving around and hitting on fives is not good. But with this ability, they'd still be moving and firing those heavy weapons. So um, yeah, that's the Rusty Claw. Better armor saves, and they can move and fire heavy weapons or advance and shoot assault weapons without penalty. And then you have the Twisted Helix Experimental Subjects. You can add one to the strength characteristics of models with this cult creed. In addition, add two to advance rolls for a unit with this cult creed. Now, I think we're going to see that one quite a lot, adding two to advanced roles and adding one to the strength characteristics. Um, I think we're going to see that one, and I think we're going to see the Pauper Princes, which is um, um, they can re-roll attacks with melee weapons when they charge, were charged, or provoke, perform a heroic intervention. And the reason why I think we're going to see the plus one strength or the re-roll attacks when you charge is because Gene Steeler cults, generally speaking, most of their infantry like to get up in people's grills and like to start slaughtering and hacking away with their mining tools and with all the all of their many many limbs. Um, of course, the go-to one, probably the most one we're going to see, the most one we're going to see, English again, Winters, come on, is add one to advance and charge rolls for the unit when they appear from reserve. Um, that's going to be a, a common one because, yes, it would be nice to have plus one strength. And yes, it would be nice to reroll your attacks when you get in there. But if you can't get in there to begin with, because you've got a nine inch charge instead of an eight inch charge, then um, perhaps we're going to see the subterranean ambushes instead, cult of the four armed emperor. Anyway, those are the cult creeds. Um, now, I think we'll just dive straight into some of the... I'm going to skip the stratagems for a second and dive straight into the um, brood mind disciplines, the psychic powers, because there's a couple in here that are really juicy and I want to tell you about them. So let's go through them all. The first one is mass hypnosis, which has a warp charge value of seven. And if manifested, you pick an enemy unit within 18 inches of you and they can't fire overwatch. And they also fight last in the fight phase and must subtract one from their hit rolls. Now we've seen mass hypnosis before, but I can't remember if it said that they had to subtract one from their hit rolls. I think that might be an addition. But anyway, picking a unit, say some jumpy dudes that have a lot of DACA on Overwatch or picking a unit like some Tau that might have a lot of DACA on Overwatch and with a warp charge value of seven saying, nope, you can't fire Overwatch all of a sudden is significant but not as significant as this second psychic power. Mind control has a warp charge value of seven. If manifested, pick an enemy model within 12 inches of the psycho and roll 3d6. And if the score is less than the model's leadership characteristic, nothing happens. So you need a warp charge value of seven first, then you need to roll 3d6 and equal or exceed the model's leadership. Now remember a model's leadership could be a super heavy it could be an imperial knight that you're doing this on 3d6 equal or exceed their leadership and once you've done it that model can immediately shoot another enemy unit of your choice or make a single close combat attack against it as if it were part of your army models can't attack themselves but they can attack other members of their unit wow so for a warp charge value of seven and, and equal or beating their leadership on a 3d6, you could pick on an Imperial Knight, you could pick on a Land Raider, you could pick on anything in the Orc army, pretty much has a very low leadership. Tau as well typically have, on average, a lowish lead, well, not low, seven or eight, but they have a, a leadership that you should be able to equal or beat, and Tau have a lot of guns. So picking on a unit, it is only 12 inch range, but saying, right, it's my psychic phase, I'm going to select that unit over there 12 inches away, and I pass, and now suddenly that unit is shooting at your stuff. Mind control. Like it very much. I think that one, I, I just like it. 
Psionic Blast is a warp charge value of 5, and this is like a smite, essentially. If manifested, select an 18, uh, enemy unit within 18 inches and roll 2d6, and if the result is less than the highest leadership characteristic of that unit, it suffers a mortal wound. If the result of the 2d6 roll is higher, it suffers d3 mortal wounds. So that's quite nice, because sometimes you just, after smiting and smiting again, Sometimes you might want to chuck a Psionic Blast in there just to get push those mortal wounds onto the enemy. 2d6, leadership, get less, one mortal wound, get more, d3 mortal wounds. Mental Onslaught has a warp charge value of 6. If manifested, select an enemy model within 18 inches and visible to the Psyker. And then each player rolls a d6 and add their model's leadership characteristic to the result. And if your score is higher, the enemy model's unit suffers one mortal wound. If the model is still alive, then you keep going, and keep going, and keep going, until either you don't exceed the model's leadership anymore, or it's dead. <laughs> so this is a way of sniping out characters. You can have your you can have your Psyker, which is an 18 inches away of that Captain, or that Lieutenant, or whoever it might be, and then it's a leadership plus D6 roll off again and again and again. If... Um, if you get less, nothing bad happens to you, but if you get more than them, then they lose a mortal wound, and you can do it again. You roll d6, add your leadership up again, keep going. That one's pretty good. Good way of sniping characters, as I said. Psychic Stimulus. Warp charge value of 6. If manifested, select a gene stealer cult unit within 18 inches of the Psyker, and until the start of your next phase, that unit can charge, even if it advanced, though not if it fell back. So we know that gene stealers can move, advance, and charge, but now you can put this on a unit of aberrants, for example. They can move and advance, sorry, um, they can charge even if it advanced, they're not fell back. So the, the aberrants will be able to move, advance, and charge. And that unit will also fight first in the fight phase as well. Um, the last one is Might From Beyond. Might From Beyond has a warp charge value of seven. And if manifested, select a Gene Stealer Cult's infantry or biker unit within 18 inches of the Psyker and add one to the strengths and attacks characteristics of all models in that unit until the start of your next phase. So again, you could put that on some Gene Stealers. Suddenly the Gene Stealers have got an extra attack and an extra strength. You could put that on a unit of Aberrants, that plus one strength and plus one attack. And say they've got the Twisted Helix Cult Creed, that which gives you plus one strength to models with this cult creed, then all of a sudden your aberrants have got plus two strength and plus one attack. Or if you're um, uh, re-rolling hit rolls for attacks made for, by a melee weapon with the cult creed, the pauper princes, so you're re-rolling all the hits when you charge, and all of a sudden you've got plus one strength and plus one attack. And there's no reason why you can't put psychic stimulus on a unit to make sure that they can advance and charge, and also might from beyond on the same unit. So not only can they advance and charge, but they've got plus one strength and plus one attack as well. And that will last until the end of your next, start of your next psychic phase as well. So if your opponent stays locked up in combat with that unit, they will do it again. They've still got plus one strength and plus one attack in, um, in your opponent's fight phase as well. So those are the psychic powers, and I like all of them. I think they're good. Even the weakest one, which is that Psionic Blast, which does one mortal wound or D3 mortal wounds, um, even that one's still nice because being able to chuck out those occasional mortal... Sometimes you don't want to chuck out Psychic Stimulus or Advance and Charge or Might. You, do, you don't want to do any of the other more juicy ones because you're out of position or you've killed a lot of stuff or it's towards the end of the battle grid, but battle round. Battle round? What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say game, towards the end of the game. So just being able to put out extra mortal wounds with Sonic Blast or Mental Onslaught. They, they're all good. They're all useful. I can see them coming into effect. Stratagems. There are three pages of stratagems in this book. And um, yeah, <laughs> there's two three-point stratagems in this book. And if you remember Agents of Vect and how much that's distressing people in the community, well, it's back in Gene Stealer Cults. It's called A Plan, Generations in the Making. Let's talk about the two three-point stratagems first. And A Plan, Generations in the Making costs three points. And you use this stratagem after your opponent has spent command points to use a stratagem, but before the effects of the stratagem are resolved and you roll a d6. On a one, 
you've just wasted three command points because that stratagem is resolved as normal. So what you're going to do is re-roll that one, no doubt. On a two to five, your opponent's CPs are refunded, but the stratagems they were using is not resolved and cannot be attempted again this phase. So a plan generations in the making is a counter stratagem. It's three command points to shut down a stratagem that your opponent wants to use, just like agent's effect. Two to five, it stops it working. On a six, they spend their CPs, they're, they're lost, those CPs, and the stratagem doesn't work. This stratagem cannot be used if there are no cult of the four-armed emperor units on the battlefield and cannot be used to, the, to affect stratagems used before the battle or during deployment. So plan generations in the making um, is for the cult of the four-armed emperor, um, cult creed. And those are the guys that um, can add one to their advance rolls or charge rolls. Um, three command points. The other three command point one is called Monstrous Bio Horrors, and it's the, for the Twisted Helix um, cult. And the Twisted Helix cult are the ones that have plus one strength. Um, yeah, they have plus one strength and add two to their advanced rolls. And for three command points, you can use this stratagem at the end of the fight phase and select a Twisted Helix Aberrant unit for your army, and that unit can immediately fight again. In addition, until the end of the turn, subtract one from the leadership characteristics of enemy units while they're within six inches of that unit. So not only are they stronger, but they can fight twice. It does cost you three command points. Now there is a third three command point stratagem, but anyone can use this. It's not um, specific to a particular cult creed. It's called the perfect ambush, a perfect ambush. Anyone can use this. Use this stratagem in the movement phase immediately after you set up an infantry or biker unit from your army that has the cult ambush ability. So this is the end of your movement phase. It's turn two, turn three. You've suddenly popped something out from underground nine inches away from an enemy unit and you spend three command points on the perfect ambush. And then that unit can now move D6 or they can shoot with all of their ranged weapons as if it was your shooting phase. Remember this is in the movement phase. Using this stratagem in your own turn does not prevent that unit from shooting in your shooting phase. So you can shoot it again in the shooting phase or making a charge move in the charge phase this turn. So it's three command points to spend this to basically shoot in the movement phase and then shoot in the shooting phase or three command points to spend this to move D6 inches when you appear from ambush and then pounce on something. But being able to move a unit of 20 gene stealers d6 inches further forward or anything really in the gene stealer cult book d6 inches further forward and then getting a shorter charge is uh that's why it's three command points because it's it's powerful right before we go into any of the more general ones let's run through the ones that are specific to the cult creeds so the hive cult who are disciplined militants who only lose half of their number when they fail a morale test. But these are the guys that can also fall back and still shoot with minus one to hit. So that's the Hive Cult, the shooty guys that can still fall back and shoot. Have a two command point stratagem called Chilling Effect. And you use this stratagem after a Hive Cult unit from your army has attacked an enemy in the shooting phase. And the attack resulted in the enemy unit losing one or more of their wounds. Then you add one to hit rolls for attacks made by other friendly Hive Cult units that target the same unit in this turn, in this phase. So you shoot something, cause a wound, then everything else that shoots at it that has a cult creed is plus one to hit when they shoot at it. Remember, layman russes and things like that can't get cult creeds. Um, cult creeds only affect infantry and biker units. But um, yeah, adding one to hit rolls, particularly as Gene Steel cults tend to suck at shooting. Um, we have the bladed cog cog. Um, stratagem overthrow the oppressors. Now the bladed cog, they're the ones with a six up in vulnerable save. These are the guys that can move and fire um, heavy weapons without penalty. These are the cyborgs, the six up in vulnerable save dudes. Um, use the stratagem before a bladed cog unit other than a gene stealer unit from your army is selected to fight in the fight phase and until the end of the phase each time you roll an unmodified hit roll of a six for an attack by a model in that unit the model can immediately make an additional hit roll against the same target using the same weapons 
and these bonus attacks cannot themselves generate further attacks. Um, so that's their little one. Um, the next one is you have the Rusted Claw. The Rusted Claw, um, these are the guys that uh, have plus one to their saving throw if they're shot at by an AP zero or AP minus one weapon. And these are the guys that their bikes can fly around all over the place without penalties to their shooting heavy weapons or assault weapons. The Rusted Claw, drive by demolitions for one command point and it only affects biker units. Um, use the stratagem before a biker unit shoots in the shooting phase until the end of the phase, add one to hit and wound rolls made for attacks with this unit's grenade weapons. Now, adding one to hit and wound rolls made for grenade weapons doesn't sound great. However, every model in an Atalan Jackals unit in a biker unit has blasting charges, and blasting charges are only strength three. Grenade D6. So, only strength three. Adding one to hit and adding one to wound means that they're going to be hitting on threes and wounding... Well, they're going to have a strength four weapon instead of a strength three weapon, essentially. They're going to be adding one to their wound rolls. Um, which is nice because the grenades, the blasting charges, are D6 shots. So that's many, many shots with adding one to hit and adding one to wound. But also, after they've done this, after the unit has resolved all its shooting attacks this phase, it can immediately make a move, as if it were your, shooting, uh, your movement phase. But it cannot charge this turn and ever move a 14. So the Rusted Claw, with their drive-by demolition, seem to have a very, very cheap one-point stratagem. They can move up. They can all do... So you've got four guys in the squad. That'd be four D6 shots coming in. Um, hitting on threes, plus one to wound. And then after they've fired all their grenade launchers in, for one CP, they'll shoot off again. Try by demolitions. That one's quite nice. Clearly, if you're bringing the biker dudes, you're going to be using that stratagem quite a lot. One command point stratagem, Vengeance for the Martyred. This is the Pauper Prince's stratagem. And the Pauper Prince's were the... Guys who can re-roll hit rolls for attacks made by melee weapons when they charge or were charged. The Pauper Princes, Vengeance for the Martyred. Use this strategy when an enemy unit destroys a Pauper Prince's character model from your army. For the remainder of battle, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly Pauper Princes models when they target an enemy that destroyed that character. So that one we're never going to see. You're going to have to see your character die. And then you get add one to hit rolls whenever you jump on the unit that just killed the character. It's only command point though. Anyway, those are the six ones that are specific uh, to the cults, including the Agents of Vect one, the one that stops stratagems, and including the one that allows the Aberrants to fight again just after they fight those two, three command point stratagem ones that I spoke about right at the very beginning. Those are the ones that are specific to the cults. Let's roll through the rest of the stratagems. One command point, clandestine, clandestine goals. Use the stratagem before the battle if your army is led by a Gene Stealer Cult's warlord and you're playing a mission that uses tactical objectives. For one command point, for the duration of the battle, you can keep your tactical objectives a secret from your opponent and only reveal them when they're achieved. I like it. Two command points is lurk in the shadows use the stratagem at the start of your opponent's shooting phase and select a gene stealer cult's infantry unit from your army that is entirely on or in a terrain feature for two command points they can lurk in the shadows if they're in that terrain feature and they cannot be shot at by the enemy unless it's the closest unit visible to the enemy it costs two command points but uh, it might keep a unit alive that's hunkering down on a critical ob objective that you need the points for Brood Coven. For one command point, use this stratagem before the battle if your warlord is a patriarch. And you can select a Magus and a Primus from your army, up to one Magus and up to one Primus from your army, and generate warlord traits for them. They don't count as warlords, but they get warlord traits. And it only costs a command point, so we're probably going to see that one quite a bit. One command point, Devoted Crew. Use this on a Gene Stealer Colts vehicle model from your army. And until the end of the turn, use the top row of the model's damage table, regardless of how many wounds it has left. So we know the Adeptus Mechanicus can do this with Machine Spirit Resurgent. Devoted Crew, for one command point, is exactly the same as that ability. If you've got Layman Russ on one or two wounds left, you can burn a command point and use the top row of the model's damage table, regardless of how many wounds it has left. It's only one command point. It's nice. 
I use it in my Admech army all the time. We are definitely gonna go. We are definitely gonna be seeing it. Um, Monstrous Vigor costs two command points, and at the start of your turn, you select an aberrant unit from your army. And until the start of your next turn, add one to the bestial vigor rolls made for that unit. For one command point, you can spend hyper metabolism on a gene stealer cult's character, and uh, that model will regain d3 wounds. Next, we have rigged to blow. It costs one command point rigged to blow, and then it's another one straight out of the Adeptus Mechanicus's playbook. Basically, when a vehicle dies, you don't have to roll a d6 to see if it blows up, it'll blow up automatically. Uh, for one command point, there's something called the first curse, which is a way of affecting gene stealers, but you're not going to see it because you roll a dice before the battle begins, and on a five or six, the unit loses its swift and deadly ability. But the save characteristic of models in the unit is changed to a four up from a five up. And that's why you're not going to see it. Because if you do it before the game begins, that means you can't use a command point reroll. And that means if you get a five or six, losing the swift and deadly ability, which is the ability to move, advance and charge, you're not going to want to use that just in case you get your five or six. The ones for one to four are pretty good, but um, yeah, it sucks. One command point, cult reinforcements. You're going to see this though. Use the stratagem at the start of your movement phase and select a gene stealer cult's unit from your army that has the troops battlefield role. And you can return up to D6 models into that unit. Each of them you have to set up in coherency and more than one inch away from any enemy models. And if you can't place any that way, it's the, the models are not returned to the unit. But for a command point, adding D6 models back to a unit they have to be slain models. You're not adding, you're not going above your starting quota, but cult reinforcements for a command point. We're going to see that one a lot. And um, because it's reinforcements, it's not going to affect the points values in match play games, just like adding Turvagons, Turvagants back to a unit of Turvagants. We're using a Turvagon in the um, Tyranid. Uh, in the Tyranid Codex isn't doesn't affect match play games. If you're buying extra stuff that weren't in your army to begin with, then you need points for it. But to reinforce squads that uh, have taken damage, it doesn't cost you the points, and it's only a command point. Two command points. Detonate concealed explosives. Use this stratagem at the start of your shooting phase if any Gene Stealer Cult models from your army are on the battlefield. Select an enemy unit and roll a d6. Subtract one from the result if the result is a character. On a four plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. So across your two command points and on a four up, it'll suffer D3 mortal wounds. You can add one if the unit contains 10 or more models. And on a four plus, that unit suffers D3 mortal wounds. And on a seven plus, it suffers D6 mortal wounds. It costs two command points, so we're not going to see it unless you're going to people might do it on a big squad of poxwalkers or on a big squad of a corn demon bomb or something like that, a unit with 20 more or more models in it. Because there's a 50-50 chance your two command points are wasted. But if you're adding one to the unit because it contains 10 or more models, then there's a three up chance that you can do D3 mortal wounds or D6 if you get the seven plus. Detonate concealed explosives. Uh, one command point, scanner decoys, scanner decoys. Use this stratagem when you set up a unit from your army that has the cult ambush ability in ambush. Place four ambush markers for that unit instead of one. So this is at the start of the very first turn, and perhaps I should narrate this at the beginning of the um, review of this codex. <laughs> but when you put your cult ambush markers down, so you keep putting four of them in ambush, so you put four markers down in your deployment zone, you can spend the command point for scanner decoys. And instead of putting one marker down for a unit, you can put four markers down for that unit. That one's really good. Say you're only keeping two units in cult ambush in your first turn. Normally you'd put the two markers down in your deployment zone. But in this case, you'll put one down for one unit and five down, four down, sorry, for the other unit. So you'll put down a total of five instead of two. And you could cluster three of them in one particular area and two over somewhere else. And your opponent can come charging towards where those three are. 
and then when you reveal your ambush markers, once there are no units left, uh, no units in your army remaining in ambush, you remove all the remaining ambush markers from the battlefield. You can only use this unit once, stratagem once per battle. You can't pick it. You can't pick three units and suddenly put three times four uh, ambush markers down all over the place. You can only use this once per battle, but this is a particularly powerful one as well. Your opponent rushes towards some blips on the left flank, and you think, nope, I'm not going to pop up there. I'll reveal these markers over on the right flank and put units down there, and then I'll discard the excess markers. And the and the your opponent rush towards some blips that just fade away, and uh, they're in the open and ready to get shot at. Um, telepathic summons. Use this stratagem at the start of your psychic phase and select a psycho model from your army. That model cannot attempt to manifest any psychic powers this phase, but instead you roll three d six, and you can add. One new cult infantry or biker unit to your army if it has the cult ambush ability and its power rating is equal or less to than the roll. That unit is immediately set up on the battlefield anyway that is more than nine inches away from your enemy models. Cost you two command points to summon something. In match play, you would have needed to play those points. In narrative play or open play, you wouldn't have needed to pay those points. Just for two command points, roll 3d6. Um, make sure it's over the power rating and suddenly you've got another unit. One command point, return to the shadows. This is the old stratagem. We're familiar with this, but for those that don't know, you can pick an infantry or biker unit in your army that's more than three inches away from any more models and they disappear back into the shadows. And then at the end of the your next movement phase, they set up again on the battlefield anywhere that is more than nine inches away from any more models. Um, if the battle is end, ends before this unit is set back up, it's destroyed. But for one command point, making units fade back into the shadows again, it's uh, we've seen it before. Um, Gene Stiller cult players use it, and it's still here, and they will use it again. Lying in wait, two command points. Use this stratagem when you set up a unit from your army that has the cult ambush ability as reinforcements. When setting up that unit, it can be set up anywhere on the battlefield that is more than three inches, not nine inches, but only three inches away from enemy models, but it cannot charge this turn. Two command points to get it really close, but it can't charge. But you will be able to get those flamers in there. Extra explosives. Use this stratagem before a Gene Stealer Colts unit from your army is selected to shoot or fire overwatch, and up to ten models in that unit that are armed with grenades can throw a grenade. Only costs a command point. And then the last stratagem in this one is one or three command points, and it allows you to take one or two extra sacred relics. Um, basically, it's we've seen it in all the other books, and you can spend command points to take more relics than you would normally have, an extra relic or two extra relics. And those are the stratagems. And as you can see, there are some very good ones in there. A plan... Generations in the Making, the Agents of Vect one, which shuts down your opponent using stratagems. That one's powerful at three command points. A perfect ambush at three command points, being able to move after you've appeared nine inches away from your enemy, so you're d6 inches closer. That one's pretty powerful. But even some of the simple ones, like what you see in the Admech book, like being able to blow up a vehicle rather than roll for it, or being able to fire all the guns on that vehicle as if the vehicle was on the top profile. These ones, for only one command point, these are very useful. We'll see them a lot because they're cheap, one command point each, and because they're very useful because you can use them in many different circumstances. But perhaps the most useful one for one command point is the cult reinforcements one. Adding D6 uh, acolyte hybrids back to a unit, or D6 neophyte hybrids back to a unit for one command point, that one is good. I like it. So there's very, so there's very, in some of the stratagems of some of the books, you read some of them and think, eh, there's not a lot of good ones in there. But in this one, when I flick through it and when I read, read through it again, and now I'm reading through it again with you guys here, it's, there's a lot of them which have a lot of utility in them. Should make a lot of gene stealer cultists happy. And of course, then you can start seeing where the combinations are. When you've got the book, you can see which stratagems work with which brood mind discipline, psychic powers, and with which um, cult creed abilities for those combinations where suddenly you've got extra strength, extra attacks, extra um, shenanigans going on. Um, yeah, lots of shenanigans in those stratagems. Um, it'd be interesting to see which ones start to shine.
So up to this stage, I was quite impressed by the book. The creeds, the psychic powers, the stratagems all seemed quite good. Then I hit the warlord traits and I went, ah, this is where the nugget is. Um, none of the warlord traits really jump out at me except for the number five, which is called Alien Majesty. Alien Majesty adds three to the range of your warlord's aura abilities. I think that will be the go-to one. Particularly if you make your Warlord a Primus, because Primus have the Cult Demigog rule, which is add one to hit rolls for attacks made by Cult units in the fight phase while they're within six inches of any friendly Cult Primus. So making that a nine inch add one to hit rolls is, seems to be the go-to Warlord trait if you bring a Primus. The other five, Focus of Adoration. Friendly Cult Infantry and Biker units can perform heroic interventions while they're within six inches of your Warlord, even if they're not a character. Two, Shadow Stalker, subtract one to hit rolls for attacks that target your Warlord. Three, Biomorph Adaptation, add one to your Warlord's attacks and strengths characteristics. Now you could pick that one if you decide the Patriarch is going to be your Warlord. Having a Patriarch with seven attacks and strength seven is nothing to sniff at. In fact, it's very frightening. I use Broodlords myself and with six attacks and strength six, they're incredibly frightening. But strength seven with seven attacks... Well, that's a little bit better. However, Patriarchs and Broodlords as well tend to die um, horribly because you throw them up the gut. So if you do pick this one, yes, it would be good on a Patriarch, but uh, Patriarchs right in the frick thick of things tend to not live until the end of the game. So you might be giving up Slay the Warlord. And if you put on plus one attacks and plus one strength characteristics on something else that you're not throwing up the gut, then you're not using the extra strength and attack that this Warlord trait gives you. But it's certainly interesting. Uh, Born Survivor, reduce any damage inflicted to your Warlord by one, up to a maximum of one. And Alien, uh, Alien Majesty, we already spoke about, plus three to the Warlord's aura abilities. And Preternatural Speed, your Warlord always fights first in the fight phase, even if they didn't charge. Those are the generic Warlord traits. Now we're going to talk about the six cult Warlord traits. And remember the cult of the Forearmed Emperor, the guy that's got the Agent's Effect ability that um, allows for three command points, allows you to stop an opponent using the stratagem. These guys, these are the guys that can also pop up nine inches away, but also do an eight inch charge instead of a nine inch charge. Well, well, these guys get D3 extra command points before the battle begins. They're not necessarily a command point farmer, but D3 extra command points is nice. And they can also re-roll one hit roll, wound roll, saving throw made for a uh, friendly cult of the forearm then per unit once per battle. Um, that's their warlord trait. The hive cult, they re-roll hit rolls of one made for ranged weapons by models in a friendly hive cult unit while they're within six inches of your warlord. They're the shooty guys, and they're re-rolling hit rolls of one. Remember, Gene Stilicots typically hit on fours as well, so re-rolling hit rolls of one is nothing to sniff at. And also their stratagem, which as soon as you've wounded a unit, then any other unit that shoots at that unit gets plus one to hit when they shoot at that unit. There's some nice combination going on there. The bladed cog, the cyborg, Gene Stilicots. Uh, their Warlord trait, after deployment but before the first battle round begins, select one unit from your opponent's army and you can re-roll wound rolls for attacks made by friendly bladed cog units while they're within six inches of your Warlord when targeting the selected unit. Um, you could put this on your Warlord and then any layman Russes within six inches will be re-rolling wound rolls when they're attacking that particular unit. It'll be particularly useful if you're fighting Imperial Knights, for example. So we might actually see that one a little bit. The Rusted Claw. Each time you fight an unmodified, each time you roll an unmodified roll of six in the fight phase for a model with the friendly Rusted Claw unit whilst it's within six inches of your Warlord, the armor penetration characteristic of that attack is improved by one. So your AP goes up so long as you're closer to your Warlord by one. The Pauper Princes. Add two to unquestioning un loyalty rerolls. Um, when they're trying to jump in front of shots that target their Warlord. Yeah. The Twisted Helix, Bio Alchemist, increase the damage characteristics of weapons other than relics uh, used by your Warlord by one. So when we look at the Cult Creed Warlord traits, they seem to be better than some of the generic Warlord traits. There's definitely some in there which look very interesting, particularly when you start getting working out the combos in this book. The relics, however, the relics are a bit of a mixed bag. 
There are five juiced up weapons, swords, um, daggers, things like that, um, which I won't go into. And there's two pages of relics in total. The first one's quite interesting actually, and it's for an acolyte icon ward. And you can add one to the strength characteristics of friendly infantry or biker units while they're within six inches of the bearer. That's very interesting. It means you've got to get your icon ward way up the table along with your gene stealers and your bikers and your aberrants. But plusing one to the strength on top of some of the other things that we've said in this book already increase your strength. Um, it's, that's a nice relic. And it's on a character, of course, the Acolyte Icon Ward, so he's not going to be targeted unless he's the closest further forward dude. Amulet of the Void Worm. You can add one to saving the throws made for the bearer against ranged weapons. In addition, enemy units cannot fire overwatch at the bearer. Can't fire overwatch at the bearer. Hmm, Patriarch again, maybe? Scourge of Distant Stars. Add one to hit rolls for the attacks made with the bearer's melee weapons, and each time... An enemy model targets the bearer with a melee weapon. Your opponent rolls an, if your opponent rolls an unmodified hit roll of one, they suffer the mortal wound. So better attacks, and when they get hit back, if your opponent rolls ones, they take mortal wounds. Again, that one's a bit... Yeah. The Crouchling. The Patriarch or Magus with a familiar can swap the familiar out for a Crouchling. And the Crouchling follows all the normal rules for a familiar. And familiars on Patriarchs or Maguses, for those that don't know, you can use them once per game and it allows Patriarchs or Magus to cast an extra psychic power. So typically a Patriarch or Magus only casts one psychic power per phase. They can use the familiar once per battle to cast two psychic powers a phase. And they could upgrade the um, familiar to become a Crouchling. And if they do upgrade the familiar to become a Crouchling, then the normal rules for the familiar apply, but in addition, the Patriarchal Magus accompanies knows one additional psychic power from the Broodmind Discipline and adds one to any psychic test it takes when attempting to manifest a psychic power from the Broodmind Discipline. Now, Patriarchs and Maguses already know two psychic powers plus smite. That means they'll get to know three psychic powers plus smite, and they're getting plus one to their casting range, so a casting ability. So we're going to see the Crouchling a lot, particularly when there's an ability in this book that allows you to take over the mind of an opponent's unit and use that unit to shoot as if it was one of your own unit. A gift from beyond. Model with a jackal sniper rifle or silencer sniper rifle only. Add two to wound rolls for attacks made, by with, made with this model's jackal sniper rifle or silenced sniper rifle unless it's targeting a vehicle or titanic eunuch. Adding two to wound rolls on sniper weaponry is good, particularly as the jackal sniper rifle is only strength four. And it works just like a normal space marine sniper rifle, the jackal dude, by the way. He's the HQ character on a bike. The HQ character on a bike should be on the screen now. Um, got big sniper rifle and it's strength four. And any unmodified wound rolls of a six cause a mortal wound, well, this adds two to the wound rolls. So you're very much more likely to wound and you're more likely to put those mortal wounds on them. Um, Voktor's Talisman, high cop model only, you can re-roll hit rolls for attacks made by the bearer's melee weapons when targeting enemy characters. In addition, each time you roll a wound roll of a 6 plus for an attack with one of the bearer's melee weapons, that attack inflicts one mortal wound on the target in addition to any normal damage. We've got the bladed cog, mark of the clawed omnisire. The bearer has a 4 up and vulnerable save. In addition, each time the model finishes a charge move, select one enemy unit with one inch of it, and on a two up, um, that unit suffers a mortal wound. Um, we have the Twisted Helix uh, Relic, which is an elixir, and you increase the att attacks, toughness, and wounds characteristic of the bearer by one. I'm thinking about Primarchs again. Actually, if you put that one, increasing attacks, tuck, toughness, and wounds characteristic, onto a Patriarch, and also put that Psychic Power on him. You're going to get up some pretty tanky Patriarchs running in there. Um, and then there's some other juicy relics, um, the weapons, upgraded swords and things like that. So relics not necessarily jumping out except for the Crouchling, that plus one to cast ability and an extra Psychic Power, and the one on the Icon Ward which adds one to the Strength um, characteristics 
to any infantry and biker within six inches of them. But uh, there's no command point farming in this book that I can find. And no huge relic in here. No one relic stands out as a must take. Um, which is probably a good thing because it's in some books we only ever see one relic. Okay, so that was the stratagems, the creeds, the cult creeds and the relics and the psychic powers and things like that. You've got some idea of the sting in the tail this army has. We talked about cult ambush and how this army can hide during deployment using these blips or hide underground and appear anywhere across the battlefield. So they're sneaky, they're quick. Um, and they're a glass cannon like the Dark Eldar used to be before they got loads of Talos and powerful things and minuses to hit. They're a glass cannon. And by that I mean most of the infantry units in here are uh, toughness 3 and most of the infantry units have a 5 up save. Um, even the high toughness things such as the um, Aber Aberrants, the Aberrants, even those guys, they're toughness 4, but they still have a 5 up save and 2 wounds. So yes, this army hits like a brick, but the, the biggest weakness of the Gene Stealer Colts was, and probably still will be, massed um, firepower, assault cannons, uh, assault bolters, uh, anything Tau. Um, you're going to want to shoot them down before they get up in your face very, very quickly. Um, but they can. They've got more toys to get up in your face very, very quickly with some of these creeds and some of these things. So anyway, let's have a look at some of these units, or the units. In the HQ slots, we have six HQs. You have the Patriarch, the Magus, the Primus, the Acolyte, Icon Ward, the Abominant, and the Jackal Alphas. Now, um, I don't know the book from before. I don't know the index very well. And it looks to me like the Patriarch does what the Patriarch does. So it's essentially a brood lord, which makes any Gene Stealer Colts unit, sorry, any cult units within six inches of it fearless. It has a five up and vulnerable save. You can bring a familiar. Unlike a brood lord, this guy knows the smite psychic power and two psychic powers. Brood lords only know the smite psychic power and one psychic power. And with a familiar, they can pop off an extra psychic power once per battle. So the patriarch is big, is mean, is a brood lord, does what he does. Uh, then you have the magus and uh, or the magus and he's your spiritual leader and any cult units within six inches of the magus uh, models at the start of the opponent's psychic phase can attempt to deny one psychic power that targets them during the psychic phase as if they themselves were a psyker so if you've got any uh, cult units within six inches of your magus you've got um, deny the witch you've got that ability for everything within six inches um, and the magus of course can take a familiar and knows a smite and two psychic powers but can only manifest one a turn but is a cheap psyker the primus is your go-to standard uh warlord because because the add one to hit rolls for attacks made by cult units within six inches of them or your standard go-to hq rather it's also a meticulous plan and the first time this model is set up on the battlefield select one enemy unit on the battlefield and re-roll wound rolls of one for attacks made by friendly cult units that have the cult ambush ability whilst they're within six inches of this model when targeting the enemy unit. That's your Primus. Acolyte Icon Ward, we know what he does as well. Um, he's basically on a six up any Gene Stealer cults within six inches of him. Ignore any wounds. He's your feel no pain guy. He's also got the banner so they reroll morale tests with him. And Aberrants can reroll vigor, ro vigor rolls of one when they're within range of the Icon Ward. The Icon Ward is a buffing character. He is in Gene Stealer Colt's armies already because he gives them that six up ignore wounds. And most Gene Stealer Colt dudes take a couple of them. The Abominant is the new HQ that we saw in one of the box sets. Basically he's a toughness five, five wound dude. Um, with a, he's only got a five up save, this toughness five, five wound dude, but he's got bestial vigor and whenever you inflict damage on this model, reduce the damage characteristics of the attack by one to a minimum of one. And every time this model loses a wound, roll a dice and on a five up, it doesn't lose a wound. So the Abominant is the closest thing to a tank that the Gene Stealer Colts book has, but a toughness five with five wounds, ignoring wounds on a five up, basically disgustingly resilient. 
and reducing the damage of. He's someone that you're going to want to throw up the table. He has got three attacks. He has got familiar claws or a power sledgehammer, which is times two strength minus three AP D six damage. And as he's got strength six, that means this power sledgehammer is strength 12 at minus three D six damage. But you do have to subtract one for hit rolls um, when you swing this power sledgehammer. So he's hitting on a four instead of hitting on threes. However, any it's d6 damage every time, but every one, two, three on the damage roll always counts as a three. So if you roll a one for damage, you're always doing three damage. One, two, three. So d6 damage, minimum three. So he's always doing three, four, five, six damage. The bit of a beast. And at the start of every turn, he regains d3 wounds. So you are throwing him up the table and uh, let him be the tank that he is. He also buffs Aberrants and we like Aberrants because they're mean as well. Um, each unmodified hit roll of a six for attacks made in the fight phase by friendly cult Aberrant units within six inches of them. Score two hits instead of one. So your Aberrants hitting away like they do, but any sixes do two hits. It's not like a reroll, it's a six and that allows you to reroll to hit. If you get a six to hit, unmodified hit roll of a six, you score two two hits and subtract one for psychic test taken for psychers that are within 12 inches of him tyranid psychers are not affected i like the abominant um there's not a lot of meat there's not a lot of tankiness in the gene stealer cults book but this guy is and if you're bringing aberrants you probably want to bring two of them um two units of aberrants two units of abominance and throw them up the table the Jackal Alphus is your last HQ slot. He's on a bike. He's got a sniper rifle. These biker dudes are toughness four. Most of them have two wounds. This HQ has got five wounds, but the other bikers toughness four with two wounds and a five up save. This guy's got toughness four with five wounds and a five up save. And all the bikes, all the new bike models have got the skilled outrider rule, which means you subtract one from hit rolls for attacks that target this unit in the shooting phase. Basically, White Scars can't jink, Raven Guard can't jink, um, uh, your, the Red Eldar dudes, what are they called? Red Eldar jet bikes that are known for flying and being the masters of the air. Liam uses them. I don't know what they're called. I don't know Eldar. But basically, all of those super space marines and super alien creatures of doom are not minus one to hit. But the bikes in the Gene Stealer Codex are minus one to hit if you shoot at them because they're skilled outriders. Somehow better than Space Marines. I guess they're a smaller target than Space Marines. On these Scrambler bikes, they can dodge right, dodge left, dodge all over the place. Maybe, maybe that's why they're minus one to hit. But maybe they need the help because they are only toughness four with a five up save. So as soon as they do get hit, you can hurt them pretty quickly. But this Jackal Alphys, remember he's a character, so you won't be able to target him. He's got a nice sniper rifle, which is strength four, minus two, D3 damage, and he can target characters. And at the start of your shooting phase, he can pop off an ability called Priority Target Sighted. So select an enemy unit that's visible to him and within 36 inch range. And until the end of the phase, add one to hit rolls for attacks made by friendly cult units that target that enemy unit while they're within six inches of him, or within 12 inches of him if they're a biker unit. And adding one to hit rolls for cult units with las cannons, or uh, mining lasers or things like that, while they're within six inches of him, will be very useful. Basically this guy is going to be staying at the back of the battlefield, popping off people with his long range sniper rifle, and you're going to have some cult units spread around him, and once per phase he's going to select uh, an, an enemy unit and he's going to say bring that one down and then all the cultists that fire at that enemy unit are going to add one to their hit rolls. Um, three troop choices. There are the Acolyte Hybrids, Neophyte Hybrids and Brood Brothers Infantry Squads. Brood Brothers Infantry Squads are basically Imperial Guard squads um, with their LAS pistols and, and LAS rifles, things like that. And the Acolyte Hybrids and Neophyte Hybrids are two different flavours of troops. Um, they're both toughness three, they both have one wound, they both have a five up save, so both of them go down like the other one, but Acolyte hybrids are strength four, whereas Neophyte hybrids are strength three. Your Acolyte hybrids 
are the guys that are more mutated and have heavy rock drills, rock cutters, lash whips and bone swords. The Acolyte hybrids, the ones with the higher strength, are your punchy guys that are coming out of cult ambush and trying to descend upon units as quickly as they can. And your neophyte hybrids, which are strength three, are your shooty guys with their blasting charges and their grenade launchers and their shotguns and auto guns and things like that. And so those are your two flavours plus your uh, Imperial Guard Infantry Squad, your Brood Brothers Infantry Squads. Those are your three flavours of troops. Then we have many, many, many elites because there's individual elite stuff now. So hybrid metamorphs um, and aberrants. Hybrid metamorphs and aberrants are, well... They're the charge units that go wheeling up the battlefield and go punching stuff. Aberrants are still good uh, at toughness four with two wounds. They still have bestial vigor, and you're going to want to have that HQ aberrant unit next to him. Then we have pure strain gene stealers, which are good, and you're going to add one to their attacks characteristics when there's ten or more models in the unit, so which gives them four attacks each, just like out the uh, Tyranid book, four attacks each, as long as there's ten or more in the unit. And if they're close to the Patriarch, they're going to be hitting on twos. And then we have all the many, many new things. The Clam Mavis, the Locus, the Sanctus, the Kelomorph, the Nexus, the Biophagus. So six new elite characters. All of these guys have got the character keyword. And let's run through them. So the... Um, Clamma, Clam, Clam Mavis, let's say Clam Mavis. This is the guy with the Scrambler Array. Enemy units that are set up on the battlefield as reinforcements cannot be set up within 12 inches of this model. In addition, to start your shooting phase, roll a d6 for each enemy unit that is within 6 inches of the Clam Mavis for your army on a 6 that enemy unit suffers a mortal wound. They also have a Hailer, a Proclamator Hailer. Add one to the leadership characteristics of cult units while they're within 6 inches. And add one to advance and charge rolls made for cult units while they're within six inches of any friendly cult clam, clam mavis. Adding one to advance and charge rolls with this guy, who's so long as you're within six inches of him, very, very interesting, particularly if you're popping up from cult ambush. Remember, this guy also has the cult ambush ability, they all have cult ambush ability, so you can hide this guy underground. Rather than using a blip marker in your deployment zone, he could pop up in turn two. So you, he pops up along with some um, hybrids, along with some aberrants, all within six inches of him. And then when you charge, you can add one to the charge rolls, so long as you're within six inches of this guy. And say you are the cult creed of the four-armed emperor as well, and when you're in that cult creed, well, they can add one to their advance and charge rolls for this turn. So this guy, the Clamavus, we're going to see him a lot. He's going to pop up in turn two. There's going to be three units popping up within six inches of him. And they're going to be adding one to their charge. And we're going to see a cult of the four-armed emperor on all of those cults that pop up with them. And they're going to be adding one to their charge. So basically, you're going to be adding two to the charge on the turn that you appear. That's a seven inch charge. You're gonna be nine inches away, but a seven inch charge? You've got some pretty good odds of making some turn two charges hit where exactly where you want them to be. This guy is an auto include. The next new character is a Locus, uh, the next to elite guy. He's a guy with a bunch of swords and he's a sword killer dude. He's got four attacks and his locust blades are minus three AP, one damage. But you can increase the weapon's da damage characters to two if the bearer made a charge move or was charged or performed, performed a heroic intervention. So if this guy's charging in against Primaris Marines, he's got weapon skill of two up, he's hitting on twos. His blade's a strength user, which is his strength four. So he's hitting on twos at strength four. AP minus three and two damage when he charges in. He's got a number of abilities like Quicksilver Dodge, which is a five up invulnerable save. Quicksilver Strike, he always fights first in the fight phase. Um, and things like that heroic intervention, he can heroically intervene six inches away. This guy is a cheap sword wielding ninja. Um, he's not going to be OP. 
Um, but he's cheap and he's interesting. So sticking him in there like a cheap version of an Eferez or Assassin, one of the Assassins, and throwing him at your enemy could be annoying. Uh, the next elite character is a Sanctus. And he's another cheap, interesting, assassin-type character. This, this guy also has a weapon skill of 2-up, but he's got a ballistic skill of a 2-up as well, and a silenced sniper rifle, which is a 36-inch range sniper rifle, strength 4, minus 1, d3 damage, and does mortal wounds if you get that 6, that friendly, juicy 6 roll. So why would you want to bring a Sanctus along? A guy with a silent sun sniper rifle. He's also got, he's not no slouch in close combat as well. He's got four attacks and he hits on twos. Um, but he is only strength three, so that's not good. But it is minus two, two damage a time when he fights. However, when this guy does a perfect, he can never have a wall or trait. He's a cult assassin, he can never have a wall or trait. But if you spend a perfect ambush stratagem on this guy, it costs zero instead of three command points. The cult ambush. Stratagem is the one that allows you to move d6 inches when you appear from reserve Or the one that allows you to shoot in your movement phase when you appear from reserve It costs zero on this guy so you can keep him in cult ambush you can keep him underground then he can pop up and He can shoot like it was the shooting phase and then he will be able to shoot again in the shooting phase And units do not receive the benefit to cover from their saving throws for attacks made by this guy so um, again, cheap, nice, little assassin, annoying, nibbly unit. The Locust, the one we talked about earlier, the sword-wielding guy, is only 40 points with his weapons. The Sanctus with his silent sniper rifle, however, is 60 points for this guy. But uh, having a character that is going to be difficult for your enemy to target because he's a character shooting away, 60 points, interesting. Next we have the Kelomorph, new elite dude. The Kelomorph is a gunslinger. He costs 60 points with all of his guns and he has three Liberator auto stubs. And the Liberator auto stubs is a pistol too. So that's six shots coming out of this guy, hitting on twos, ballistic skill of a two. Um, they're only 12 inch range, these Liberator auto stubs though. But he does hit on twos, they are strength four minus one AP and two damage at time, and he can target enemy characters even if they're not the closest. And in addition, each time this model hits an enemy with a pistol weapon, it can immediately make one additional hit roll against that target using the same weapon. These bonuses cannot themselves generate further hits. So every time he hits with his pistol, he can make one additional hit roll. And he's got three pistols, and he hits on twos. So when this guy pops up, he's putting out six, seven, eight shots, so long as he's hitting, and he's going to hit with his pistols, isn't he? Um, so he's going to be using each of those pistols to hit and hit again, so long as each of the hits are from a different pistol. If this model kills any enemy models with its ranged weapons, then until the end of the phase, you can reroll hit rolls of one for attacks made by friendly cult infantry units while they're within six inches of this guy. Heroic deeds, heroic in, heroic deeds, heroic inspiration. The Kelomorph, so sixty points. So what we've got here is we can see we've got a, the Locus is your sword assassin, the Kelomorph is your shooty assassin, and the Sanctus is your long range sniper assassin. We've got some interesting characters, interesting flavour that you can add to the Gene Stealer cults. The next up new character is called a Nexus. Nexus, Nexos. He's fifty points. And he's your command point farmer. Um, basically, after he's, he's got a couple of abilities, the strategic coordinator allows you, after he's been set up, to move one of your blips, one of your ambush markers in your deployment zone, and set it up more than 12 inches away from any enemy models, so long as it's still in your deployment zone, strategic coordinator. So you can move one of the blips. But the other thing he does is he farms back command points. Um, on, a, on a six. Every time your opponent spends a command point or every time you spend a command point, um, you can add one to the results. So you farm them back on a five or six if there's at least one Primus or one Cop Nexus from your army on the battlefield. Um, so on a five or six, he's getting back command points essentially. But you're going to need a Primus on the battlefield to farm command points on a five up, and you're going to need a Clamavus 
to uh, farm command points back on a five up when your opponent spends command points as as long uh, with, along with this nexus guy. So if you've got a Primus and the Clamavus, you're farming them back when your opponent or you spend them on fives. If you haven't got those models, then it's a six. The last new elite character is a Biophagus, and he's a buffing unit as well. This guy has gen genomic enhancement. This model can enhance one friendly cult aberrant unit that's within one inches of it at the end of your movement phase. So you can move the aberrants in close, you move this guy's in close, or alternatively, he pops up from Cult Ambush Underground. Some aberrants pop up underground next to him, so long as they're within one inch of each other. You roll a dice, uh, roll a d6, and on a one, one model from the selected unit is slain. So you're going to lose your aberrant. Then you roll a d3 and refer to the table below. Um, see what bonus the survivors of his little um, fun and games get for the rest of the battle, and the unit can only be targeted by this ability once per battle. So the Biovagus sticks a needle in the arm of the aberrants that pop up. On a one, one of them dies. Otherwise, roll a d3. And on a one, they get plus one strength. On a two, they get enhanced resilience, plus one toughness. On a three, they get enhanced aggression, plus one attacks. Now, this guy's cheap. He's only 35 points to upgrade your aberrants. And if you want to, you can spend 12 more points to get an alchemist familiar with him. So instead of 35 command points, it's 47 command points. And uh, then you roll 2d3 when upgrading your aberrant units instead of 1d3. And you can keep both of the results. So for less than 50, 35 points to do it once, or for less than 50 points, you can do it twice. That's cheap. Now he can only enhance one friendly unit at the end of one turn and it can only that unit can only ever be enhanced once but if there's two units nearby in one turn he can enhance one unit and then in the next turn he can enhance another unit so he's going to be good too so you bring your new hq aberrant dude who buffs aberrants and then you bring this guy as well he sticks needles in their arms you're going to get very very juicy aberrants running up the tables after that, we get onto the fast attack slot. Uh, previously in the fast attack slot, we have cult armoured sentinels and cult scout sentinels. They're still here, and the rules for them largely haven't changed, or haven't changed as far as I can see. And they function just the same as um, Imperial Guard sentinels. But we have two new fast attack choices. Um, one is the Achilles Ridge Runner, and the other in, is the Athlon Jackals. The Athlon Jackals are the biker unit. We spoke about them before. Toughness 4, 2 wounds, 5 up save, they move 14 inches, and they're skilled outriders. It's minus 1 to hit them when you're shooting at them. Um, these guys have 2 attacks, and they can take 2 weapons. And if you're taking the weapons, they can, they can take power picks, power axes, things like that. So they're only strength 3, but with power axes and power picks, they're going to be strength 4. They're going to be very quickly shoving their way up the table very quickly. Um, they come in units of 4, or 8, um, or 12, and for every 4 bike dudes in a squad, you can add a dude on a quad bike. The quad bikes are called Atalan Wolf Quads, and the Atalan Wolf Quads, so you've got 4 bikes on one quad, can take uh, a, an incinerator, which is basically a 12-inch range heavy flamer, Auto hit in D6 times, strength 5, minus 1, 1 damage. But 12 inch range, that's nice. And they can take mining lasers. Now it's a heavy gun, the mining laser, 24 inch range. But it is a LAS cannon, strength 9, minus 3, D6 damage. So as soon as these guys are moving, instead of hitting on 4s, they're hitting on 5s. But again, you can get that cult creed for this squad. So they can be moving around 14 inch range, firing a mining laser and still hitting on fours. Mining lasers are expensive though, 24 inch range, 50-50 chance to hit. Hmm. But what are these guys doing? What, what they're doing is they're getting, they're moving around very, very quickly. So while your stuff is appearing from reserve and charging forward, these guys are harassing the flanks of your enemy with their shotguns, with their auto pistols. They're 10 points a pop. They are quite cheap, these bikers. Um, and the wolf quads, the quad itself that you can put the heavy flamer on or the mining laser on, is 15 points. So 
yes, their toughness four with two wounds and a five up save, they're going to go down like they're going to go down pretty quickly. But at ten points of pop, ten of these guys is only a hundred points. Then you start adding some of their weapons, and many of their weapons are free. The auto guns are free. Shotguns are free. It's the power picks, power axes, things like that. Two, five points. So when you put some treats on top of these guys, when you give them a bit of sting in the tail, they're going to cost between 12 and 15 points. And moving 14, they do fill a slot in the army. You're not necessarily going to want to, going to, want to throw these at high target units, elite units. They're a nibbly force. They're a raiding force. They're to pick off troops. They're to snag objectives. Um, they're to draw enemy fire, things like that. And they're cheap enough to do it. Now, the Achilles Ridge Runner is the new vehicle on the block in this book. We already have the Goliath Trucks, and we know what they do, and the Goliath Rock Grinders. And Goliath Trucks and Goliath Rock Grinders are relatively tough for the Gene Stealer Colt, um, uh, because the Gene Stealer Colts haven't got a tough feel to them. And uh, the Goliath trucks are 10 wounds and the Toughness 6 or Toughness 7. The Rock Grinder's Toughness 7 with 10 wounds. The truck's Toughness 6 with 10 wounds and a 4-up save. Ridge Runners are only Toughness 5, but they have 8 wounds, so they don't degrade. So Toughness 5 with 8 wounds and a 4-up save, they don't degrade. That's interesting, because with a Ballistic Skill of 4+, plus, they have a Heavy Mining Laser. Heavy Mining Lasers are 36-inch range. So you're not going to want to move because all of a sudden you're hitting on fives instead of fours. Heavy mining laser, 36 inch range, hitting on fours, heavy D3, strength nine, minus three, D6 damage. An Achilles Ridge Runner with a heavy mining laser and a flare launcher, which comes as standard, is 80 points. And the flare launcher is each time the model loses a wound, roll the dice, and on a six up, they don't lose that wound. So, uh... 80 points for a toughness 5, 8 wound, 4 plus save model that doesn't lose wounds on a 6 with a heavy mining laser on top. Strength 9, minus 3, d6 damage at 36 inch range. 80 points. That's quite cheap. Um, if I was running an army, I know that cultists can struggle against armor, which is why you see layman russes in Gene, Gene Stealer Colts books or heavy weapons team with las cannons. If I was running a Gene Steel Cult Army, I'd probably get four of these guys. Um, you can bring, it doesn't come necessarily a unit of one, you can bring in a unit of up to three. Um, so probably two units of two I'd bring these guys, because those heavy mining lasers are really nice. You could, the heavy mining laser is um, 25 points. You could swap that out instead for a heavy mortar, which is only eight points. And a heavy mortar does allow you to fire indirectly. You can target units that are not visible. And it is a heavy mortar. It's D6, strength 5, minus 1, 1 damage. Um, so it's kind of an anti-infantry type weapon. And being able to pick up units that are out of line of sight, that's nice. But Gene Steeler Colts don't tend to struggle against units that are out of line of sight because they're ambushing up all over the place and they can jump on those units that are out of line of sight. What they tend to struggle with is that anti-tank ability. And uh, yeah, heavy mining laser. They're also a scout vehicle. They can move 9 inches at... Uh, start other battles so long as it doesn't end them within nine inches of an enemy model. Um, they also have a survey auger. Units don't receive the benefit of cover for saving throws made by a model with a survey auger. And if you want to increase that heavy mining laser by a further six inches, you can stick a spotter in them. Spotters are only five points and spotters increase the range characteristics of its range weapons by six inches. So that's 85 points for a 42 inch range heavy mining laser. Very interesting. Um, I can see these guys being used more than the Atalan Jackals because of that hole that the Gene Steelers cults sometimes struggle with, which is anti-armor. Um, I say they struggle with anti-armor. If they get up in your grill with all their rock scores and, and hit you like a truck, like they should, then they're pretty good against armor. That's if they punch armor. Um, in the heavy slot, we have Cult Layman Russ, uh, Brood Brothers Heavy Weapon Teams, Goliath Rock Grinders, Goliath Truck, and a Cult Chimera. The Cult Chimera, sorry, is in the dedicated transport. And the Chimera and the Layman Russ function just as they do in the Astra Militarum. The Layman Russ has grinding advance and emergency plasma vents. 
It has all the different guns that you could want to put on it, from a Vanquisher battle cannon up to Eradicator Nova cannons. And uh, they fill that slot that you need. Um, and Chimeras are Chimeras. Goliath trucks, Goliath rock grinders haven't changed. They're, they are the, the Goliath truck is your transport capacity of 10 go-to quick transport. Mind you, you might want to chuck Chimeras in there because they have a transport capacity of 12. Or pick your Goliath rock grinder with a transport capacity of 6 and just go wheeling in there with your drill dozer blade. Um, this guy, your Goliath rock grinder with their dozer blades at the front, so long as they're not injured, so 6 to 10 wounds, they have 6 attacks. 3 to 5 wounds remaining, they have d6 attacks. And when this drill dozer blade hits you, that's plus 3 strength. So that's strength 9. Minus 2 damage, d3, minus 2 AP, d3 damage a time. And the bearer can make an additional d3 attacks on the turn where it makes its charge move. So the Goliath Rock Rider goes in with 6 attacks plus d3 when it charges. Hitting at strength 9, minus 2, d3 damage a time. You don't want these things smashing into your lines. And of course, the last heavy weapon squad that we didn't mention is the heavy weapon squad. Is the last cannon in the backfield. That um, You don't necessarily have to bring last cannons. You can bring missile launchers if you want to. But they're like, work out like guard heavy weapon teams. Anyway, those are all the units in the new Gene Steeler Cult book. Minus the Tectonic Frag Drill. And the tectonic frag drill is a single model and it costs something. It costs 75 points and after it's set up, it cannot move for any reason and is not treated as a friendly or enemy model and cannot be targeted or affected by attacks or abilities. 75 points to put these things in your deployment zone can't be targeted. So if you have a shooty castle in the backfield, that's where you want to put your te tectonic frag drill because once per turn in the movement phase, one infantry or biker unit with the cult ambush ability can move off the battlefield and then next turn appear next to your tectonic frag drill and so they can help support the castle. And the other thing that the tectonic frag drill can do is drill. Basically you need to have some models on it, um, so long as a couple of models on your army are on it. You can, at the start of your turn, um, well, you can activate the drill and then at the start of your next turn, uh, subtract two from charge rolls made for units whilst they're within 12 inches of the model. This won't affect units that can fly, but it can help keep your shooty bit a bit safer because they're subtracting two from their charge range. It's also got seismic quake where you draw a straight imaginary line from the drill to a point on the battlefield and roll a d6 for every unit it passes over on a 4 up that unit suffers d3 mortal wounds and um, its move characteristic is halved until the next movement phase that's psychic seismic quake but to do this you need to activate the drill that's seismic tremors and seismic quake so to slow units down when they're charging or to do this imaginary line across the battlefield you need to activate the drill so if a model from your army is on a tectonic frag drill at the end of your movement phase and there are no enemy models on it you can activate it to do so roll a d6 for every unit on ground level which is within three inches of the large drill and that unit immediately suffers d6 mortal wounds for every unit that's on the ground floor then roll a d6 adding one to the result for each other time the drill on this model has been activated during the battle if the total is less than six the seismic tremors result below takes effect and on a roll of a 6 plus the seismic tremors and seismic quake results take effect. So seismic tremors is basically pretty much always going to kick in because you've got to roll a d6 and get less than 6. So you're always going to have that minus 2 to hit. But to get greater than 6 you add the turn numbers. So the next movement phase it's d6 plus 1 and the next movement phase in turn 2 it's d6 plus 2. And then once it's a 7 plus, then that seismic quake thing kicks off where you draw a line from your drill across the battlefield and on a 4 up uh, units take D3 mortal wounds. So um, it's a way of um, getting units back into your deployment zone that have the cult ambush ability. And it's a way of in later game turns, in game turn 2 and game turn 3, potentially doing wounds, free mortal wounds. Uh, to enemy units all the way across the battlefield underneath this straight line. 
So you could have a couple of these things back there, the countless fortifications, you could have a couple of them there drilling away. But to do it, you need units on it. And also, you don't want anyone near the ground floor because they're going to be taking mortal wounds because the drill is very, very painful. And it would be easy to lose the drill. If you lose the drill, then um, I don't know if enemy models, enemy units could then take the drill and do it back to you. It says for you to activate the drill, you've got to have models on your army on it. And it's also got the faction keyword, Gene Stealer Cults. So if enemy models get it and get on top of it, I guess they can't activate the drill and start doing mortal wounds back to you. Um, maybe if you did a narrative about it, you'd allow that, but certainly not in match play. So the chances of it still doing mortal wounds with its seismic quake ability, this straight line in turn four and turn five are probably low because an enemy is probably going to want to swarm it. However, if you're going up against a shooty army, if you're going up against Tau or Imperial Guard or an army that likes to stay back, even some Adeptus Mechanicus's armies, which is ironic as this is an Sector Mechanicus piece of kit, then um, potentially you could still be hurting them in later game turns because you'll still be in charge of your own drill. Anyway, those are all the units in the Gene Stealer Cult book, and it's a good book. I think with the addition of the new units in here, it certainly feels like a rounded out army. Um, many of the stratagems and the creeds are working well. I do like the ambush ability, the, putting these blips down in your deployment zone and the ability to do shenanigans with the blips by removing three of them or by moving them around or even spending those command points on those um, fake blips. Um, you could potentially spend a lot of command points before the game begins on or in turn one by moving your blips, but uh, it's it, it'll be interesting. Very, very interesting to play against them. And also, the narrative in this book is quite good as well. So all in all, it's a good bit of kit, and the Gene Stealer Colts will be a force on the battlefield and popping up nine inches away and charging seven with seven inches, only a seven inch charge with some of the combinations in here. It's it's a good book and it's we're going to see it. We're going to see it do well, I think. Um, so all round well done, all, all round good job by, by Games Workshop there. Gene Stealer Colt players will be very, very pleased to get their hands on it. And um, I think that'll be the end of my review. Thank you very much for listening. If you're in, in, if you want to listen to some more Winter's SEO bits and battle reports and big debates and system talks and things like that, then please uh, join us in the Deployment Zone. Check out www.deploymentzone.tv. Um, that's my greedy bit of capitalism over and done with. But I do encourage you to enjoy us and, and, and join us in the Deployment Zone. We're having good fun in it. Uh, thanks, Games Workshop, one more time for sending it through. And um, thank you all for listening. Happy Wargaming.